Let's study Parshat Vayechi with our commentator Rashi. We are looking at the words of Jacob's blessing to his grandchildren, Ephraim and Menashe. Here we have wonderful words of blessing in chapter 48 of Genesis, verse 16 for his grandchildren. The one right before that, verse 15, is the blessing for his son Joseph. But we'll concentrate on this three-part blessing that he makes for his grandchildren, the only occasion of a grandparent blessing his grandchildren in the Torah. And from that, of course, everybody's encouraged to find blessings for their children, their grandchildren, for their friends, their students. But here, uniquely tailored language for the blessing. May the angel who redeems me from all evil bless the lads. And may my name be declared upon them, and the names of my forefathers, Abraham and Isaac. And may they reproduce abundantly like fish within the land. That's familiar sounding language because we use it as a special blessing for the youth at Orzeruah when we call them for their aliyah on Simchat Torah. Hamalach ha-goeloti, hamalach ha-goeloti, mikora, yivarech et ha-nearim, vikarevahem shemi. Shema Avotai Avraham V'Yitzchak V'Yidgu L'Rov B'Kerev Aretz. We sing that to them and we are invoking Yaakov's language for the youth of our generation. But what did he say to Ephraim and Menashe? Or pointed out to be the first Jewish children born in diaspora lands, by the way, by commentators. He says, May the angel who redeems me from all evil bless you, youths. So what does it mean to be redeemed from evil? Well, Yaakov might have been referring to one of two things. First, he might have been referring to his feeling the evil or just depressing spirits that he experienced in his life. Redeemed me from feeling so down. May God also redeem you from making some meaning of your life. When I reflect on my life, Yaakov might have been thinking, I remember when Yosef was torn away from me. I recall the drought and famine. I recall when Benjamin was taken. I recall the, the, the lack of brotherhood among my children. I recount the struggle with my own brother Esau before that. Life's been a series of challenges. And maybe he had this sense that there was a malach, uh, an angel, divine presence, God's presence, that really helped redeem him from feeling so, so much despair in his life. And he wants that for Ephraim and Menashe. If they experience any of that, let them be redeemed. If there's true evil that awaits, of course, let them, let them, let them be saved. What does he really want for these Two grandchildren who are, as mentioned, children of the diaspora, to be counted in the chain of Jewish history. So he then moves in his blessing towards connecting them to Abraham and Isaac and the great story of the ancestors and the ancestral homeland. He'll affirm that too in asking his son Joseph to bury him in the land of Israel. But here he wants Ephraim and Menashe to be connected and that the next generation should be connected to their ancestors. Know from where you came. Know who your ancestors are. Be connected to their stories and all that they stand for. So finally, he then ends his blessing a little bit like God blessed Abraham. Abraham one day would be as numerous as the stars in the skies, according to God. Well, here... Yaakov says to Ephraim and Menashe, I want you to be as numerous and abundant like the fish in the sea, uh, wherever you are on the land. So he says, Fayid gularov v'kerev ha'aretz. But it's only translated as reproduce abundantly like fish within the land because of the rabbinic text that points out the connection between the verb Fayid gu, that you should be numerous, and the word dag, that is found within the verb. The fact that the verb stands for being numerous, like we see school of fish, so numerous in the sea, so abundant in the sea, is understood. 
but it doesn't necessarily have to be translated like that. Translation I read you indeed uses the rabbinic text that points out the connection between Vayidgu and Dag, that they may be numerous like the fish because the word Dag is planted within the verb. And that's what Rashi points out. And so it's using the rabbinic text that Rashi invokes in his commentary. Points out, Kedagim halalu veravim, that these fish are numerous, shepadrim, and they proliferate, they are abundant within the sea. And here's what that really means when he gives them a bracha like fish, that ein ayin hara sholetet behem, that fish, these fish, are not plagued by any kind of evil eye that is turned upon them, that they can avoid danger if they act together like a school of fish. They, they can create the kind of familial structure and strategy for warding off all that oppresses them, all that opposes them, and all the dangers that might face them. That indeed for the Jewish people would be a challenge. And the rabbinic text that took that direction, of course, is, is also addressing some of the challenges to rabbinic culture that the sages felt at the time of the Roman occupation in the ancient land of Israel. In the Talmud, in Avodazara, on page three, the Talmud will ask, why are people compared to the fish of the sea? Or why specifically are the Jewish people compared to fish in the sea? Because the Gemara says, once fish are out of the sea, they're on dry land, they die immediately. And so too, with regard the, to the Jewish people, that when they separate themselves from their ocean of culture and experience, from words of Torah, from performing mitzvot, they will die immediately. And we can't have that. So he blesses them that they should be abundant upon the face of the earth, that they should be connected to Haaretz and anywhere on the land. They should be connected to their strong culture, their familial ties, and to the divine presence who seeks to save them from, from all danger and lift them forward on their journeys. That is the blessing that Yaakov makes for his grandchildren, and ultimately, because we're all children of Israel, for all B'nai Yisrael.